What a joy it is as we come together and worship God and wish for me to have this privilege to share with you from God's Word. And today we take a look at John chapter 12, verses 12 to 26. And it is really a passage preceding many of the things that are going to happen in Holy Week, so to call it. Uh, it is a time for us to really reflect and think about. And this coming week is an opportunity to, for that reflection to take place. In 1991, when Barbara was by her father's bedside on Father's Day, she was watching him grasping for life. As tears poured down her cheeks, she took the time to speak to her dad one last time. Trust Woody wrote the book, Stories for a Man's Heart, and amongst all these stories was this story entitled Just Enough Time. I wonder what would you would have said to a dying parent? Or what would you talk about? I thought about it a lot. And I wonder what I would have said to my dad when he passed away. But often we would ask the question, what is life? Really, instead of that question, we should be asking another question, and that is, what a life! People thought that through the ages to ask this question, what is life, or what's the meaning of life? It can be a philosophical question, but it can also be an introspective one. We have heard some years ago that M1 advertisers said, one life, live it. The issue of instead of trying to ask the question about life, we should just leave it as it is meant to be. You already have a life. Finding the answer to the question does not make sense until you begin to live the life meaningfully. No matter how long, no matter how short, or how he had turned out to be or become. I was reminded by a Cambodian proverb that says, life is like a droplet of water on a lotus leaf in a pond. How transient life is. But what do we make of it? Jesus came to give life, and those who receive it may live it abundantly. He said that just a couple of chapters before this one that we are studying today, Francis of Assisi said, Keep a clear eye towards life's end. Do not forget your purpose and destiny as God's creature. What you are in his sight is what you are and who you are, and nothing more. Remember that when you leave this earth, you can take nothing with you that you have received. Fading symbols of honor, trappings of power, but only what you have given, a full heart enriched by honor, service, love, sacrifice, and courage. What's a life worth? Or what have you given in life? Now this passage is a big preparation for the coming week as we remember what Jesus had done on the way to the cross. It is a preparation for the remainder, a reminder of the life of Christ. His life ended on the cross, but life returned when he was resurrected. The one life is a life we are looking at to remind ourselves of hope and grace, of love and life through eternity. Let's begin by taking a look at verses 12 to 18 as a section that we start with. But before we look at this passage, we have to go back to the previous chapter to understand some background to this. Now take a look at the first part of this chapter. It was to be a celebration of life in a small town called Bethany. In John 11, the people celebrated because one man was dead. And Jesus came and brought him back to life. Now when you were dead and life was returned back to you, wouldn't you too celebrate? Three weeks ago, my sister, though she had kidney failure, just died suddenly of a ruptured aorta. It was devastating to the family, and more than anything else, to my mother, who is still alive. Now if she is to be raised back to life, I believe it would be a grand celebration and the media would be there and the whole world would know. And yet, 
if we read again this passage from verses 9 to 11, right after Lazarus was raised, the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death again. Now, these religious leaders plotted to kill this man whose life was returned. Why? All because Lazarus represented a threat to their own personal pride and reputation. This man, Lazarus, was too dangerous for them. He was a threat to their integrity and their reputation. When your life represents a danger to others, your life may not worth anything at all. Now, this view, of course, violates the sanctity of life itself. No wonder people continue to ask, what is life? Or what is life worth? Lazarus's life was not simply a testimony of life after death, no matter how spectacular that might have been. Because suddenly, Lazarus' new life was nothing compared to who these religious leaders wanted to be at that time. And Lazarus had to be killed. Now from verse 12 onwards, we read that a large crowd had gathered. It was the week before the huge celebration in Jerusalem, the Passover feast. Many from around the country would have started to arrive for the celebration as well at that time. Everywhere it was packed with people. The Passover was a celebration dating back to Egypt and the Ten Plagues. And you would remember that the Ten Plagues or the Tenth Plague was the Passover when the angel of death would come and pass over every household that had the doorpost splashed with blood, both the horizontal and the vertical. And only then the firstborn in that household would survive, would live. And that was the Passover that was to have been the event that all these Jewish people, when they gathered, they celebrated how God, by His grace, saved the entire race. Now, meanwhile, for the people in Bethany, the raising of Lazarus only added to the popularity of Jesus. Now, contrary to the religious leaders, these people saw more than a personal threat to their credibility. They saw that Jesus could actually be a fulfillment of biblical prophecy of the return of their king. The Jews' yearnings for the return of the king is in the same, same league as that of David needed no introduction. The waving of the palm, palm branches was actually a Jewish national symbol of hailing a hero or a returning king who had conquered the enemies and someone who had been accorded immense respect. Like King David, their all-time hero in history. Now, it has reached a climax. With Jesus, after the Jewish people were plunged into subjection to foreign rule under the Romans, they were indeed hoping and crying out to God for relief and salvation. They saw the coming of the spiritual and political leader in Jesus. And the mob mentality created a setting for the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. There was a riotous welcome, much like David after winning a war and returning into his hometown, re receiving a hero's welcome. And for the people at that time, it was a hope to give them a new lease of life. The humiliation of being subject to a foreign power and the desecration of their place of worship were enough to stir up in them more than a national fervor to rise up against their common enemies. They saw in Jesus that hope and the possibility of an end to their humiliation. They welcomed Jesus as a giver of life, no matter how small, how narrow that understanding might have been. Now even before, uh, even more so, when the news of him raising Lazarus to life spread around, any extraordinary or spectacular event would be communicated like wildfire. What about the raising of a man from the dead in a small town just adjacent to Jerusalem itself? The religious leaders, on the other hand, felt the news of Lazarus coming back to life from the dead might not have been authenticated, and hence, it merely just 
a rumor for them, or a story by Jesus' followers to boost his popularity. Nonetheless, they were agitated further as to what was happening because Jesus was becoming too popular for them. And they had more resolve in determining in their hearts to terminate Jesus' life, and along with him, Lazarus. Both the religious leaders and the people at that time missed the real meaning of life. The leaders saw life only through their own selfish eyes. The only life for them is a life of pride, of selfish honor, and that of their own. The people saw life only from the point of an earthly kingdom, political stability, and prosperity and peace of a country under the unity of one single ruler of their own choice, in their own understanding. But it was not what Jesus came for. Today, many people who come to church seek God. They come to find God and find life and try to understand it. They look at life from their own perspective as well. They want to seek a God who dispenses blessings, prosperity and health and peace. They want pride and honor for themselves. But perhaps these same people are celebrating with us, worshipping with us in our own worship services, singing hymns of joyful praise and even saying amen to prayers being said. But in their hearts, what do they really seek? What life are they living? In John 12, 16, John tells us that the disciples did not understand these things. They did not understand how the symbolic king of Israel would come into Jerusalem in a lowly donkey. If he was in the same genre of King David, the returning king with the spoils of war and prisoners of war as slaves after a victorious campaign, this king would have been on a stately horse, high and mighty, fully armored and full of pride and prestige. Now more than that, they could not comprehend how this king, being honored now, would go on to die a humiliating, painful, and seemingly unjustified death, which he kept talking about. It was beyond logic and human reasoning. It was not their logic or the world's logic. It cannot be acceptable. And yet it belongs to God. And he has used the lowly to shame the strong. He had used the last to bring honor to those on top. Are you down and out? Are you lonely and struggling? Do you feel that no one even understands you? Turn to God and trust in His wisdom. Look to Him for the wisdom of life and live it to the fullest. Earlier in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said to us, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now that is the life that the prophets have talked about. In Ezekiel chapter 34, 12 to 15, where the good shepherd would seek out his sheep, rescue them, and bring them to good pasture, and feed them to their great content. And then in Isaiah 49, verses 9 and 10, where assurance of provision was given. And these are God's promises about to be realized in Jesus Christ, now as he possessed into Jerusalem on a lowly donkey. The next section in 20 to 26 is about the anticipation of life to come. This is a very interesting section, especially when you read verse 19, because it talks about a prophetic statement. Take a look. It talks about the Greeks or the Gentiles claim that they accomplished nothing and that the world has gone after Jesus. Now, of course, the world would have included the Greeks who were at that time referred to as ones who come and worship at the feast. They had, referred, they had been referred to as God-fearers at that time. Now, this is a very profound revelation and that at such an early time, Jesus is already being said to have captured 
the attention of the world. Now in this section, the Greeks were probably there when Jesus cleansed the temple and they had been impressed by him. Compared to the myriad of Greek deities as well as having embraced many other pagan religions, monotheism of Israel was a very attractive and persuasive religion for them. The Greeks had always been very loose in following strict moral laws. The moral values of the Jews and the behavior had long left a huge impression on them. And so in verse 21, these Greeks or Gentiles approached Philip to ask him to approach Jesus. Philip was a good choice. And he was a Galilean, he was of Galilean root and probably one who spoke Greek as well. And yet at the same time, Philip seemed to be uncomfortable in going directly to Jesus and he sought out Andrew. Andrew was also a native of Bethsaida in Galilee, likely the brother of Simon Peter, the disciple of John the Baptist and who also became a disciple of Jesus. Now the request was a serious one. One that indicated doubts, but genuine and sincere questions. This request led Jesus to respond by saying, The time has come. Now, I want you to note that all this while, until this point, that before this event took place, Jesus has always been saying, The time has not yet. Now, he says, The time has come. So now it has. Now, very interestingly too, if you study the, the whole book of the whole gospel of, written by John, this is right in the middle of the entire book. It's the midsection, and it is a changing point in the gospel of John. So right at this middle uh, of the gospel of John, the writer unveiled the centrality of the mission of Jesus Christ. The time has come. And from this point onwards, it is moving very quickly to the point of his death on the cross. The Christian faith is an Easter faith. It has everything to do with death and life. Now you note that I did not say life and death. It is definitely not just a faith based on moral teachings as the Greeks have understood. It is now seeking Rather, the Christian faith is based on the conclusion of Christ's earthly ministry and mission to the cross. And at this point, the beginning of Passion Week, as many have recognized it, is the beginning of Holy Week. It is the entire week with many events that led to the death of Christ on Good Friday. Yet, Friday without Sunday will make it incomplete. So without the resurrection, there is no significance for his death. So it has to be a long week of death and life. Jesus rightly said in verse 23, The time has come. Why? Because the Son of Man is to be glorified. The time has come for a very definitive purpose. It is the glorification of Jesus through his death and resurrection. It is his obedience to death on the cross, and on that cross, the Father would come and sacrifice his Son with glory. His death is to bring glory to the Father in chapter 12, verse 28. And then later in chapter 13, verse 31, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified. And to be glorified simply means to be honored. It implies the giving up of personal glory for the honor is given to the act of complete submission and surrender to the lowest and meanest of acts. Death, a termination of life for a God who is sovereign and eternal. An eternal God has an end. Unbelievable, unacceptable. If that's ever the case, then he is never God anymore. And yet, that act of death brings glory and honor, a profound and incomprehensible act to human understanding, 
to worldly comprehension. Now, of course, this led to the curiosity of the Greeks, and this that had led many others to make the same clarification for a deeper understanding and the meaning and mission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A non-believer was asked how he felt after watching the movie, The Passion of Christ. He said, it was powerful. Everyone must see it to understand the pain someone has gone through for each one of us personally. Now, it's interesting that a comment like this came from a non-believer. It was also an act of supreme sacrifice of God. As God, Jesus gave up his own glory in order to bring glory to God and to lead us to glory in God. Jesus gave up his own life to bring life to those who had lost theirs. He gave up all this so that he may usher in the kingdom of God to those who once willfully disobeyed him and wanted their own ways. He gave his life so that we who believe may have life. He explained all this with the illustration in verse 24, when he talks about the grain of wheat, which has to die in order to bring new life. Had Christ not willing to give up his life, there will be no life for us and no glory to God. So similarly, as any of us wants to find life, that person must first need to die to sin and embrace the life that God has come to give. Now in conclusion, I, I'd like us to take a look at verse 26. Jesus is very clear in revealing to his followers how they may live the life that he came to give. He used two phrases. First, he says, follow me. To follow means to imitate, to do the same thing, or to go along with. What did Jesus do that he asked us to follow? He gave up his own rights. He surrendered himself. He willingly died on a cross. He obeyed God to the Father to the end. Would we follow him and do the same? The second phrase is related to service or a servant. He says, if anyone who serves me. Now the idea of servanthood is an alien idea for worldly beings. The very reason why we fall from grace is because we want to glorify ourselves. We want to be in places of honor. We want to do things our way. We want to be our own boss. We want to call the short. We want to be in control. We want to be king. We want everything to revolve around us. The religious leaders as well as the people gathered to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem were all examples of such an attitude. They did not want to serve. They wanted control. They wanted power. And they wanted to be king makers. What's a life like? Are you struggling to be in control? To be king makers? To be your own boss? To mind your own business? To do your own things? and to make your own decisions. Very interestingly, a famous author, Henry David Thoreau, who wrote against slavery in America once said, many go fishing their entire lives without knowing that it is not fish they're after. It's so true, isn't it? That many live their entire lives going after things or even after people without knowing that all these things have nothing to do with their lives. Jesus was the complete opposite. He came to serve. He came to give. He gave his own glory. He died for others. This coming week and the situation we are faced with today calls us to follow him. To be servants. To serve. For you? What do you live for? Remember the question, what a life? Perhaps as you find the answer to the question, you may really begin to live a life that others who know you 
will remark. What a life! This is what others see Jesus in you. Remember the Greeks, the non-believers who came to want to seek out Jesus and ask uh, Philip and Andrew to bring them to Jesus. And what, what did they say? They said, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And when they do, will you ask the same question? Will you lead people to Christ? And when, we, when others look at you, at your life, do they see Jesus in you? Do they remark, what a life? Let's pray together. Our Father, you came, you gave, you loved, you died, so that we may have life and have it abundantly. Father, this week as we continue our reflection and thinking through what you have been through on your way to the cross, Help us to think about the sacrifice you have made and what it means for us to follow you, to be like you, to be servants. We look at your life and we can remark, what a life. But when others look at ours, do they say the same? Help us, Lord, to live our lives in such a way that others would say, what a life. Because we love you and follow you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name.